evening by a little bit after four o'clock. Um, you'll hear us testing as always, and you'll hear you might see some camera movement as we film our cutaways. But please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be starting shortly from Geneva. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on WHO Twitter account. Uh, thanks to all journalists who are here in the room, those who are dialing in by phone, and those who are watching us online through Zoom. For those who are online, it's a clicking raise hand to ask questions. For those who are dialing in, it's a star nine. Uh, today we have a Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General. We have Dr. Jawad Mahjoug, who is Assistant Director General for Emergency Preparedness, and Dr. Sylvie Brion, Director of Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness here at WHO. As always, we will have a, we will have audio file available immediately after the press briefing, and transcript hopefully will be posted tomorrow morning. I hope you all know where to find those um, briefing materials. So uh, I'll give a floor immediately to Dr. Tedros for opening remarks. Thank you, Tariq. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me start, as always, with the latest uh, numbers. As of 6 a.m. Geneva time this morning, China has reported a total of 75,567 cases of COVID-19 to WHO, including 2,239 deaths. In the past 24 hours, uh, China has reported 892 new confirmed cases and 118 deaths. The significant decline in new uh, confirmed cases is partly due to another change in the way China reports numbers. As you know, last week, China started reporting clinically diagnosed cases in addition to laboratory confirmed cases. They have now switched uh, back to reporting only suspected and lab confirmed cases. This may indicate because the health system in Wuhan have regained the ability to test all suspected cases. As a result, some cases that had been clinically confirmed have now been subtracted from the total because they have tested negative. Although the number of cases in Hubei province continues declining, we're concerned about an increase in the number of cases 
in Shandong province, and we are seeking more information about that. Outside China, there are now 1,152 cases in 26 countries and eight deaths. Although the total number of cases outside China remains relatively small, we are concerned about the number of cases with no clear epidemiological link, such as travel history to China or contact with a confirmed case. Apart from the Diamond Princess cruise ship, the Republic of Korea now has the most cases outside China. And we are working closely with the government to fully understand the transmission dynamics that led uh, to this uh, increase. We are also concerned about the increase in cases in the Islamic Republic of Iran, where there are now 18 cases and four deaths uh, in the last, in just the past two days. Uh, WHO has supplied testing kits and will continue to provide further support. Our concern continues to be the potential for COVID-19 to spread in countries with weaker health systems. Tomorrow, I will address an emergency meeting of African health ministers held jointly by the African Union and the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Meanwhile, the WHO-led joint mission in China has been working in Beijing, Sichuan, and Guangdong, and will travel to Wuhan tomorrow to continue its work at the epicenter of the outbreak. We're working with all of, uh, with all of partners under GORN uh, to safeguard the health of the members of the team and to take appropriate measures when they return to their countries of origin. I'm also pleased to announce today that we are appointing six special envoys on coronavirus, uh, on COVID-19, uh, to provide strategic advice and high-level political advocacy and engagement in different parts of the world. I'm pleased that the following eminent individuals have accepted my invitation to act in this role. Professor Dr. Maha El-Rabat, former Minister of Health of uh, Egypt. Dr. David Nabarro, former Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, uh, Goals and Climate Change. Uh, Dr. John um, Ken, Ken Gasong, uh, director of the African Centers for Disease Control and uh, Prevention. Uh, Dr. Mirta Roses, former director of the WHO region of the Americas. And Dr. Shin, uh, Shin Yang Su, uh, former regional director of the WHO region of the Western Pacific. And Professor Samba So, director general Center for Vaccine Development in Mali. As I said yesterday, WHO's key role is coordinating the global response to the epidemic, and our new special invoice will help us to do that. This is another step we're taking to take advantage of the window of opportunity we have to contain this outbreak. Once again, the measures China and other countries have taken have given us a fighting chance of containing the spread of the virus. We call on all countries to continue their commitment for containment measures while preparing for community transmission if it occurs. We must not look back and regret that we fail to take advantage of the window of opportunity that we have now. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, before taking questions first from the floor and online, just to remind everyone uh, dialing in that it's uh, star nine, and those uh, watching us uh, online, it's uh, clicking raise hand on the computer, so we'll start questions from the room. Uh, Musa first, please, if you can just introduce you, the outlet you are working for. Uh, Musa, uh, Musa Alfi, uh, I'm a 
Daniel Bezet. Euh, ma question en fait aujourd'hui concernant une question là. Donc ma question concerne l'Iran et le Liban. Le Liban aujourd'hui, on a annoncé à Beyrouth qu'il y a un cas en provenance de l'Iran. Est-ce que ces deux pays euh, ont les moyens de faire face à ces virus et quel rôle le WHO peut euh, jouer ou assister ces deux pays à faire face Est-ce que vous avez des contacts avec ces deux pays pour organiser quelque chose Merci. So, uh, thank you very much, Moussa. It's about uh, Iran and Lebanon uh, that have uh, announced cases. Uh, do these countries have a health system strong enough to deal with this, and how WHO can help them? No, merci beaucoup pour votre question. Oui, ils ont les capacités de base pour détecter ce type de virus, mais nous sommes en train de discuter avec les deux pays quelles sont les possibilités de coopération et aussi quels sont leurs besoins en assistance technique. La preuve, c'est que le cas du Liban, il a été détecté à l'aéroport. Donc les autorités libanaises ont mis en place un système qui qui euh, cherchent les cas symptomatiques dans les vols provenant d'Iran et qui leur proposent le, le, le diagnostic et le traitement. Donc c'est comme ça que ce cas a été détecté. Ça, ça, ça prouve jusqu'à un certain point que la capacité existe. La même chose en, en Iran et le bureau régional euh, de, la, de la Méditerranée orientale est en train de travailler avec eux pour pouvoir un peu euh, évaluer la situation et aussi voir quels sont le, le, la, 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 les besoins en assistance technique de notre part et nous sommes en contact permanent. Can we do a shorter English version, please? No, I think uh, the, the two countries they have the basis, the basic uh, capacity to deal with, to detect this kind of viruses, uh, and uh, the, the case in Lebanon was detected detected in the airport because they were screening the symptomatic cases coming from Iran, and this is how this case was detected. And we, the original office in Cairo, is now in contact with the two countries to assess the situation first, and to uh, try to evaluate what is the kind of technical assistance that these two countries may need, and we are ready to provide uh, this technical assistance. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Majur. Yes, please. And then our Japanese colleague, and then we will move online a little bit. Yes, please. If we can just, if we can just uh, press. Uh, it's Yang with Xinhua News Agency. Uh, uh, imagine that the, the international experts group will go to Wuhan tomorrow. So is there any uh, specific steps they're going to conduct in Wuhan? Yeah. Um, as I said it a uh, couple of times ago, uh, the expert group uh, is fully empowered um, to suggest and also operate based on the situation on the ground. Uh, so that's uh, up to them on what to focus and, and also the next steps they want in, in Wuhan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tejas. Uh, yes, please. Hello, good afternoon. I am Ring Telo uh, from Nikkei, Japan Media. <coughs> uh, you pointed out in South Korea and probably in Japan, in Singapore, it is indeed a fact that COVID-19 has spread rapidly in recent days, although the fatality rate is still low. Even in this situation, do you say that you have not yet observed uh, um, any clear community uh, transmission outside China? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. Indeed, uh, um, we are looking at the numbers and uh, also working very closely with those countries to try to understand um, and, and to get um, uh, give meaning to those numbers. Um, as you know, uh, we have seen in previous outbreak of uh, SARS and, and mers cov uh, what we call spreading event. So in those kind of events or situations, we may have a rapid increase in numbers, but as 
long as we can understand how the transmission has occurred and how uh, the new cases are linked to this event, uh, then uh, we can also uh, uh, make sure that we can uh, um, stop the transmission. And so uh, this is the kind of uh, investigation that all countries are doing currently, um, trying to differentiate is this a, a community, a low level community transmission that were undetected or do we face uh, this kind of super spreading event uh, where uh, more cases are infected than uh, we see usually with just person to person transmission. And so we are monitoring the situation very closely. Uh, in South Korea they are still very committed to stop uh, transmission and, uh, and so, uh, but at the same time uh, taking the right measure to uh, contain uh, if we have a super spreading event. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now go uh, to some journalists uh, online. We will start uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Banjo Kaur from India, calling from down to earth. Uh, uh, Mr. Kaur, can you hear us? Hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so my question is to Dr. Tedros Heiser. Uh, you said in your opening remarks that China changed the strategy again because their investigative or their, their surveillance met methods have improved. But they started with lab-confirmed cases, then they went to clinical diagnosed cases too, when the number spiked for about 15,000 in a day. And now they have gone back to lab-confirmed cases. So don't you think that this, you know, seesaw has created some sort of epidemiological confusion, not just among researchers, but also among journalists and people at large? My second question is regarding uh, the, the Diamond Cruise ship. Though uh, passengers have started disembarking now, but do you think in hindsight that quarantine of so many people on a ship was a right strategy and it did not go wrong, especially for those people who were on board? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaur, and my apologies for uh, not recognizing that it's a female name. So, two questions. Okay. Would you like to start with the first one? So, I think on the epidemiological situation in uh, Wuhan, uh, as we um, said earlier, and, and we observe in other epidemics, it's not uh, unusual to uh, uh, count things um, in a different ways uh, as the epidemic evolves, uh, because as uh, Dr. Tedros said, uh, it's also related to the capacity to uh, have uh, laboratory diagnostics. And so what is really important uh, in epidemiology when you observe an epidemic is to uh, remember that surveillance or monitoring of the disease aims at taking the best possible decision. And so it's really numbers for action and not numbers for numbers. And so as long as we understand how things are counted and what the numbers include, then it helps us to make the best possible decision to protect the health of the people. And so this is why we are in constant discussion with Chinese authorities to understand how things are counted, uh, which basis, and uh, beyond the number, what is really important is the trends, but also the intervention that can be taken uh, to um, uh, really uh, down um, or curve down uh, the epidemiology curve. So this is why we are focusing on, on more understanding their definition rather than really looking at, at the numbers, because at the end of the day, uh, a small difference in numbers, uh, if the dis the, it's a good decision behind it, is probably what matters most. Mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, for the action taken by, uh, by in the uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship, I think. Uh, Usually, when uh, health authority take any decision, they take it ba based on the local context, for, context first, based on career risk assessment and career risk management, and take the decision. And it, uh, it's very difficult in the middle of the action to look to how this, uh, to some, to some extent, these measures were or not helpful. But what we recommend to all countries is after the event uh, to do an after action review exercise where uh, all the people who were involved in this, including WHO and others, 
uh, to assess the, the, the measures taken to take the lesson learned and to come up with, with the solution for the future event. Okay. Thank you. Maybe I will add uh, to that, to the first one, uh, I fully agree with what uh, Sylvie said. Then in addition to that, um, best, better approach would be uh, to have the confirmed lab cases and suspected cases. Uh, we do that for Ebola too, by the way. Until they're confirmed with lab testing, we keep them as suspected, and once they're lab confirmed, then they're taken as confirmed cases. So China has moved into this kind of um, uh, method, which is, uh, in our uh, analysis or in our uh, case, uh, better actually. Because if you, ha if you call the clinically confirmed cases as confirmed, when you test it in a lab, the clinically confirmed cases could turn out to be negative. So that's why in a place where we have laboratory capacity, the recommended approach is to have the lab confirmed cases from the suspected cases. So you have the lab confirmed and then those who are not confirmed yet, the suspected cases. That really brings clarity in the approach. And we're glad that China has come back to that uh, kind of um, uh, counting. And this will bring clarity, actually. And um, I hope, uh, as you have asked, Namaste, by the way, uh, this approach will bring uh, clarity. Uh, then on uh, disembarking, I agree with what uh, Jawad said. And one thing I would like to add is our advice to Japan and other member states was any action they take, it should be proportional to the public health risk they see. And they have already deployed their experts, and they told us that the measures they have taken is proportional to the public health risk they have seen. So we take that, but as Joe had said, there could be something that we can learn from, especially when we do the after action review for, for, for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gower. And uh, we will go to next question from Helen Bransfeld. Helen, can you hear us? Hear us? Hi. Yes. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, Dr. Uh, Tedros, I think it was yesterday you were talking about the window may be closing. Today, we've heard that um, Tehran has announced they have 18 cases and four deaths. Likely they have a lot more cases if they've already got four, four deaths. Uh, a Canadian who was in Iran has been tested positive in Canada. Somebody in Lebanon who has been in Iran has been tested positive. Is this outbreak at a tipping point now? Um, Helen, um, I, Helen, that's why I, I said many times actually the window of opportunity may be closing. Um, and you have rightly said that, you know, the cases we see in the rest of the world, although the numbers are small, but not linked to Wuhan or China, it's very worrisome. And then Iran in the past two days has reported 18 cases and five deaths, I think, four, four deaths. This is very concerning. But not only that, there is a case which is linked to Iran now in Lebanon. This is a 45 years old uh, woman. And these dots are actually very concerning. Take them as dots or trends. So what I believe is the window of opportunity is still there. Uh, but where our window of opportunity is narrowing, I would put it that way, narrowing. And that's why we called the international community to act. And that's why I explained yesterday, although we're asking for, uh, you know, the international community to act quickly, including the financing, that's not what we see. So 
again, I fully agree with what you said, but my analysis of the situation is the window of opportunity is narrowing, so we need to act quickly before it closes uh, completely. That's what I, I would uh, suggest, and thank you so much. It's a very, very important uh, question, and that's what we have been saying since the declaration of FIC um, end of January. Now already in 21st February, so it is really narrowing. That's how I put it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can we take now, if we have uh, online, uh, uh, Walter Yetz? Walter? Walter? Oh, hello, I am here. Yeah, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I would like to ask Dr. Tedros about um, something he said yesterday concerning the misinformation spreading on social media. If something that you would suggest that us journalists do to help prevent that and come and combat this certain uh, misinformation that is being spread. Thank you. Um, I think the misinformation, I call it infodemics, um, is actually um, causing panic and fear in many places. and. Uh, from the start of our daily press briefing, we, we, we have said a lot about it, and we will continue to uh, really say uh, uh, about it. But not only <laughs> talk about it and, uh, you know, ask for the international community to act, but we are taking uh, practical measures too, working with Google, working with Facebook, and working with Amazon, Tencent, and, and so on uh, to help in addressing this misinformation. And one of the practical actions is this major social media outlets are directing any questions towards the uh, reliable um, sources like WHO, and other institutions in other countries, reliable countries, including like CDC and, 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 and so on. So that's what we are trying to do, and we will continue to work uh, with them. And scientists have also a role uh, to play, especially in addressing some of the misinformation. Uh, as you know, uh, there was uh, misinformation circulating in the social media and, and elsewhere about the source of the virus, especially some people believe that it was designed in the lab. Uh, but uh, we, we had, probably you have seen, there was a publication online uh, that refutes uh, that um, uh, hypothesis and uh, shows that this uh, virus is not actually designed in the lab. Of course, we have to take this study with caution until we get the source. Where the source is, we have to continue to uh, do, um, you know, continue our research to really see where, where the, source, the source is. But there is already a reliable um, article. I, I, I hope you will have a look at that. That refutes the claim that this is uh, a, a, a virus that's designed in, in the lab, but further studies will be necessary. Thank you very much. Let's take uh, one more uh, online. Uh, Gracie Wren from uh, Health Policy Watch. Gracie, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Uh, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, please go ahead. All right. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, it's a little bit of a follow-up to Helen's question. Uh, if, if the window of opportunity is narrowing as countries scale up preparedness effort, they also need to prepare to deal with patients with potentially severe respiratory diseases, right? So outside of uh, screening and diagnostic capacities, what are, what are WHO's plans to help strengthen countries' hospital capacities um, to deal with these cases, particularly for weaker hospital systems with you know, weaker infection prevention control like measures like that? Okay. 
Um, yeah, thanks. So um, uh, on this issue of um, um, strengthening uh, hospital capacities, we act on uh, many fronts. Um, firstly, is uh, working with uh, healthcare workers uh, to uh, give them the right training, and you will see online we have some uh, online courses that can, they can access, but also uh, provide them with uh, advice on how to protect themselves. And we work closely with a number of countries to uh, make sure that they have enough uh, workforce to deal with uh, a number of cases. Um, and so this is part also of, of our preparedness activities in many countries, especially when we know that they have um, a healthcare system that will have have difficulty to cope with an uh, increase in, in cases, in severe cases. So we work with them to identify first where they can uh, hospitalize those cases, those severe cases, and make sure that those uh, few facilities have the capacity to um, uh, take care of those patients and provide the necessary uh, logistics and supply uh, if needed. So this is part of the preparedness activities that have been ongoing for the past two weeks and and more, uh, and more uh, focusing on, on those countries where uh, they are in highest needs. And so we have, this is why we did um, um, a strategic preparedness and response plan to uh, prioritize those countries and make sure they have the, this capacity in hospitals in particular. Thank you. Um, can I ask a clarifying question really quickly? So Very quickly. Yes, thank you. So specifically for respiratory capacity to deal with like severe respiratory cases, you need a lot of specialized equipment in certain cases, correct? So uh, what about kind of that? Aspect. Yeah, and so, but what is very important with uh, those cases is first, before being severe, they are usually mild, and uh, we need to also, uh, that's why we focus on early detection of cases, because if we can uh, uh, treat them uh, early as early as possible we have also uh, opportunity to uh, prevent them to uh, become severe cases so we really try to um, uh, protect uh, the highest risk population uh, as early as possible so that uh, we have less severe cases as well thank you very much uh, shane please we go back to the room thank you thank you Shane from China Central Television, CCTV. Mm -hmm. My question is about China for Dr. Tedros. So despite the change of the counting mechanism and also the China's, um, some of the Chinese workers are going back to their positions. In general, what do you think about uh, all these changes and also to the measures and um, what do you have the confidence? The confidence has still that China will defeat the virus soon, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the uh, lab, uh, I mean the counting of cases, I have already said it. And taking what we have been doing before with a lab capacity, the best is to have the suspected cases and then take them as confirmed when you do lab tests. That's very clean. So going into that is good instead of clinically confirmed cases, because clinically confirmed means it could be negative or it could be positive. So that's why we're saying uh, what China chose now is clean. Mm -hmm. And it's good that they have moved to that. But we also understand, you know, they were using the clinically confirmed cases because it could be because they had the lab capacity was uh, low because of a big number of cases. The most important thing is based on your situation to shift into doing uh, the better approach. So we have to be very flexible on that. Then on containing the virus, uh, we still believe that we can contain the virus. And what China is doing, serious measures in Wuhan and, and Hubei province and others uh, hammering at the source uh, can help us to, to contain it. Uh, and other countries, since we have now number of cases, 1,000, outside China, uh, other countries should also be very, very uh, serious. And that's why I said, although the window of opportunity is narrowing to contain the outbreak, we still have a chance to contain it. But while doing that, we have to prepare at the same time for any eventualities, because this outbreak could go any direction. It could even be messy. But 
What I'm saying is it's in our hands now. If we do well within the narrowing window of opportunity, we can reverse any or we can avert any um, serious crisis. If we don't, if we squander the uh, opportunity, then there is a serious problem. There will be a serious problem in our hands. So and that's what WHA is saying. Okay, so there's also part of my question about the workers or the employees going back to their work. So what do you think about that? Because that will definitely help the China recovery from the economy. But well, yeah. Yeah. That's what I said. In China or other countries, our advice is to take measures very proportional to the public health problems they see. That's our advice. And I hope China is doing that and other countries are doing that. Do you encourage the workers to going back to their positions? We don't go into specific recommendations because we have to, uh, you know, de see, uh, you know, the details of what's what's happening if we are going to recommend, and we need to sit uh, together. Uh, but the, with the question you're asking, and the, uh, you know, what we would recommend as. Uh, or put our general uh, uh, position is to encourage countries to take proportion, you know, measures which are proportional to the public health response. Thank you. Let's see if we have. Uh, uh, well, Jamie was raising his hand. Go ahead, you go. Go ahead. Okay, so please. Hey, please. I was showing you also this side because it's tired of it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Hugo, Hugo Miller from Bloomberg News. Um, could, yeah, it's on, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you're comfortable with the methodology, the shift in methodology of clinical versus lab testing in, in China. Um, but just today, 200 cases were, were reported from prisons that had previously been excluded. So are you comfortable that there, that the, the methodology now is something you can understand and relate to, and there will be no more surprises. And is there any concern that that um, in the in a, in a rush to to reach a conclusion that net new cases in China are dropping, that the not every potential case is being considered in in their methodology? Mm -hmm. Thanks. You know, uh, the international experts and Chinese counterparts, a joint mission is working together. So if there are unanswered questions, they will tell us. Thank you. On Iran, on Iran are you getting the, you, you said you're particularly concerned about cases that don't have a direct link to China and, and Iran to Lebanon is, a, is now a worrying link. Are you getting the information you need so far from Iranian authorities? We're getting information, but we have to engage them even, even more because in two cases, having 18 cases and four days in our hands is serious. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, please, and then John, and then we will see if we have time for one more online, and then we will have to conclude. Jamie, very short question, one question. <laughs> uh, hi, Jamie, Associated Press. Um, just wanted to know, we talk, you've talked a little bit about these clusters, but um, these clusters that are far from China, what does it say about this phase in the outbreak? Are we getting closer to a pandemic? And could you just give us a quick update about the infection spread among in healthcare settings, in healthcare settings, both within China and outside of China? Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think indeed uh, what uh, we see is a very different, uh, I would say, phase of this outbreak, depending uh, where you look. Uh, and for instance, uh, uh, there is a situation in Wuhan, which is a specific special type of situation. We have also a situation in different provinces in China. Uh, and then we have what is happening uh, outside China, where the number of cases is still very limited. And, um, and this is why we are also able to see a different cluster of cases and uh, investigation on this cluster. So um, indeed, we see that the situation is, is evolving. Not only the number of cases is increasing, uh, but also we see different patterns of 
of transmission in different places. So, um, and this is why we are monitoring it and, uh, and uh, Dr. Tegros kindly organizing this uh, uh, press uh, conference to just uh, uh, showing that uh, we are monitoring the situation, uh, looking at what is happening uh, everywhere, trying to have as much information as possible from each of these situations. And we are closely working with countries to have the more detail possible to try to understand really what is going on. Uh, is it the same type of transmission as we have seen at the early stage of this outbreak or are we moving to another phase of the epidemic? And so we try to also qualify as much as possible this situation, but you understand that we have a lot of diversity, uh, different outbreaks uh, showing uh, different faces, and so uh, that's why we try to um, uh, make sense of all those different uh, experiences we see across the world. Uh, but uh, as Dr. Tedros said, uh, uh, we still have this window of opportunity because we think that even if in some places we see a large cluster of cases, uh, it's still uh, we uh, can monitor where they are coming from and what is going on. Uh, and so we need to um, continue to monitor the situation very closely until we can say uh, that the situation is completely different. Healthcare settings. Healthcare settings. If you want to do. Yes. Okay. So similarly, in healthcare setting, we have seen uh, different uh, patterns, uh, including in, in China, because um, uh, nosocomial transmission um, has happened at the early stage of the outbreak uh, and was based probably on the lack of knowledge uh, about the disease or the virus uh, itself. Uh, but we have seen also that these uh, nosocomial transmission, when uh, healthcare workers were aware uh, of the disease and the virus, uh, we have seen a decrease on those uh, transmission. So it's a good sign. It means that with knowledge, uh, we can reduce the risk for uh, those uh, uh, professionals. Uh, however, we see as well that uh, uh, when uh, healthcare workers are overworked uh, or not in uh, uh, enough numbers, uh, then uh, the infection prevention and control measures are less uh, uh, strict uh, and, and then they have uh, more risk to be infected. So uh, we are continuously uh, trying to investigate those uh, transmissions just to make sure that uh, we know really what is happening and we can propose the best uh, uh, countermeasures, especially in hospitals, uh, and make sure that we are not missing any uh, potential mode of transmission that could put uh, healthcare workers at risk. Yeah, I fully agree with what Sylvie said, overworked health professionals at risk. In addition to that, health professionals that are not properly protected. And that's why in our uh, presser last week, we raised the alarm of having shortages in protective gear, major, you know, basic equipment that health workers uh, need. And that's why I have already asked major um, companies, around 14 of them, if they could help us in providing the necessary uh, equipment, PPE, so that we start from protecting our uh, health workers. When a health worker is infected, you know, it, it's serious. And nosocomial transmission is one of the uh, methods of transmission that can really uh, spread actually any, anything in a very high, high rate. We have seen it in Ebola, and it can happen also in uh, uh, Corona. Uh, then, um, are we closer to pandemic? I would like to assure you that we are following this virus 24-7, round the clock. And I don't know if my colleagues actually are uh, taking enough uh, rest. And we are involving the best experts globally. And we are discussing regularly. With the international experts we have, good number of them representing all regions and excellent experts, we have weekly consultation. But we have also internal experts and we assess uh, the AP we have regularly. And as you know, we have other uh, platforms that we are always checking 
what the situation looks like and uh, where uh, we're uh, headed. Uh, so we will continue to, for, to follow up, but as we speak, our situation is that we're still in a, in a phase where containment is, is, is possible with a narrowing window of opportunity. And if there is anything move into another uh, level, then uh, we will announce it as soon as possible. We'll be the first to tell you that we're uh, shifting into another level. Thank you very much. We have time for two very short questions. First in John, and then we will go to someone online. John, please. Yes, good afternoon. John Zarakostas for The Lancet and France 24. Um, Dr. Tedros, could you elaborate a bit, or perhaps your colleagues on the podium here, the, the virus, uh, the new cases in Iran, is the virus still stable? You said that it's a very worrisome situation. And secondly, you've got now an outbreak in a country that's subject to strict sanctions by the UN system. Could that be a hindrance, or you have assurances from the international community that that will not impede your ability to act in Iran? Give a start. So, um, on the virus itself, um, uh, I don't have yet uh, the the ID of this uh, virus, uh, but um, uh, what we have seen in in previous um, uh, sequencing that were done in different places, uh, it was uh, quite stable. So I imagine that it's not uh, different here. Uh, but the concern is more about uh, the fact that we have seen an increase in cases, very uh, um, uh, very uh, rapid increase in a matter of, of few days. And so uh, we were just wondering uh, what is the extent of this outbreak and the transmission in Iran, and also because we have seen um, the, uh, I mean, other cases uh, picked up in Lebanon and, and, and Canada, so we are just wondering uh, uh, um, about also the potential of uh, more uh, exported cases in the coming days, and that's why it's concerning because we would like all the countries in the world to be aware and to make sure that they will also uh, put in place uh, the right uh, um, detection measures uh, so that we can pick up those cases as early as possible and uh, not allowing this virus to spread further uh, in the coming days. And um, so this is on the virus itself. Uh, okay. And, uh, there was a question on the sanctions. On <laughs> Uh, on uh, <laughs> on uh, sanctions, as you know, in emergency si situations, mainly during you know any uh, uh, what do you call it uh, outline the terms of sanctions, emergency situations are excluded. So uh, we hope we will have all the uh, opportunity we need to to, to support. Thank you. Uh, was there any question here in the room? Yes, please. Sorry, I, I didn't see you, so please. You mentioned your concern about these dots and um, what that might say about the potential for moving to another phase of the virus. Um, just linking that back to the, the post-action assessment on board the Princess cruise ship, do you see that post-action report as potentially useful to people potentially dealing with new clusters? And if so, how quickly will that post-assessment report be completed and when will we find out the results? The after action is review. usually a process uh, led by, by, by the country where the event is occurring and with the, the help or not uh, of uh, international agency. And uh, we, will, we will definitely propose this uh, uh, action review with, to the Japanese authority and to, to try to do it together. But the, the major 
uh, outcome, expect the outcome of these exercises first to study the situation, to see what's well done well and not well, and also to come up with uh, lessons learned that help nationals to improve, but also guide WHO and help WHO to improve their guidance, and not only WHO in this case, other agencies who are dealing with, uh, with chips and boats will also be inspired by, by the after it's, it's it's a learning exercise where we come up with conclusion to improve the global community preparedness in the future. Thank you very much. And we can take one last question, if everyone agrees. That's from our friend Kai Kuferschmidt, who is online. Kai, can you hear us? Yes, thanks for taking my question, Tariq. So, Tedros, you have been very clear about the strategy on this. Uh, hammer the virus in China at the epicenter, try to keep it from spreading. You've also said that the window to do this is narrowing. I mean, we all know that we have to think in scenarios. So what I really wanted to ask you is, you know, at what point do you consider that window closed? What, what, what has to happen for you to consider that window closed? And what is the strategy that WHO shifts to at that point? No, thank you, Kay. Um, you know, I don't want to preempt the thinking of the scientists we're involving. And as we speak, they're actually engaged, and they're really working on all the data data we have. And uh, we will expect, uh, you know, their analysis and also uh, recommendations. And we're involving as many experts and very known and respected scientists as possible from all over the world. And I know when. Um, we finalize the analysis, we will get a very good quality uh, analysis based on science and, and, and evidence, and we will announce that as soon as we have it. So we're working on it. We're following the situation 24-7, and we will tell you exactly what the outcome of that analysis is uh, as soon as we're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. We will conclude uh, with this. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching us. Uh, as uh, we have announced to Geneva-based core, we are not planning to have press conferences over the weekend. Uh, but if that changes for whatever reason, we will let you know. Thank you very much.